Well, greetings and welcome to a short video, a 10 minute video um, on the Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, and whilst you're watching this video, perhaps take some notes and uh, my class, I will test you on this video at the start of the next lesson. So Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Well, I can't lie, it's one of my favourite poems. It's a, a fantastically historical uh, poem, which is why I like it. Uh, but it's quite a tragic one as well. And the poem describes one of the greatest military blunders in British military history. Um, and it comes from a war called the Crimean War, uh, which took place uh, in 1853 to um, 1856. Uh, the British and the French fighting the Russians. And uh, this is about the Battle of Balaclava. And you can see that picture there. It's on horseback. And um, these 600 soldiers uh, rode uh, into battle um, and they took on uh, guns. And of course, they were completely uh, slaughtered. But the poem really symbolizes a Victorian ideal, a Victorian way of thinking, um, uh, which was a glorious death. Um, it's noble, it's honourable to die for uh, one's country. Um, and this poem really suggests that, that actually to die for king and country, although tragic and although painful as the poem really does uh, exemplify, um, it carries that notion that it is honourable and noble and patriotic uh, to die for one's country. Um, yes, absolutely. Brilliant poem. Uh, let's see what we think of it. So let me read it to you. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why. Theirs but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well, into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the 600. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the guns there, charging an army, while all the world wandered, plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered, then they rode back, but not the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honour the charge they made. Honour the Light Brigade, Noble 600. So let me take you through a few things about this poem. So I'm going to look at cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon in front of them. And of course, you'll recognise uh, that uh, that's anaphora. It's repeated words at the start of lines. And the fact that it's a cannon that's repeated, of course, shows kind of their helplessness. They're surrounded by guns. They're in a valley um, and, um, uh, you know, they're attacking with sabres, which are their swords. But that anaphora really kind of highlights the hopelessness of the army's plight and the dominance of the Cossacks and the Russians. Um, who are there. But the alliteration of the C sound there with that anaphora, I think that really emphasises the power and the aggression uh, of those guns. And we've seen that sort of alliteration with uh, Ozymandias' sneer of cold command, but we see that there as well. But what's also repeated is the word them. And that repetition, I think that really depersonalises the soldiers. Um, as if they've lost their identity. Again, we've got the idea that they're just a collective. There's no individuality um, here. They've just become uh, machines of war, similar to remains um, and similar uh, to kamikaze as well. So those two things there, that anaphora and that repetition of them is really, really uh, important for us. And then we've got that phrase, road the 600. I really like this phrase. Uh, other English teachers don't actually, but uh, I love that verb there, road. It almost creates that sense of pride. It's very honourable that they were that they were riding and they're almost proud of what they're doing. They're, they're, they're patriotic. They're, they're, they're doing it with a sense of pomp and circumstance and, and going into battle. Um, and certainly that's what Tennyson is trying to kind of illustrate for us, is that these guys are doing something incredibly noble um, and that they're doing it for... Uh, 
um, for the Victorian ideal of fighting for one's country. Um, it's quite an uncomfortable one for us to read in 2023. Um, it really, really is. And then we've got that phrase, the, the 600. Again, what that does, it amplifies that idea that they're fighting as a group. There's no individuals uh, and there's no uh, names uh, either, which is which is really, really uh, fascinating. And then we've got these really interesting phrases here came through the jaws of death. Now, that's obviously a metaphor. Um, and for me, that shows, although this is honourable, it's glorious in Tennyson's view, uh, it's also painful and it's torturous. And that metaphor there um, almost shows the pain and torture and the suffering that's awaiting the soldiers. I remember someone saying once as if they're, you know, uh, being slowly digested, they're being, they're being eaten alive, quite frankly. Uh, there, That's the, um, the significance of that metaphor. But think about your own interpretation of that. And then we get that biblical metaphor. Um, um, you know, back from the mouth of hell. And that's to really um, kind of extends that idea that war is a place of, you know, eternal torment. If we're using that word hell, eternal torment, uh, and you're there for, for a long time um, and it's not particularly pleasant. So that's the impact of those two, uh, two aspects there. And then we've got uh, honour the charge they made, honour the light brigade, noble 600. Now, the, the first words of these lines provide us with kind of glorious language, and that really represents the Victorian view of war, that we're honouring these people um, um, who died because of their uh, because of their sacrifice. But what's interesting is that that is an imperative verb. And it's almost like we're being commanded and told by Tennyson to think in a certain way. You will see this as honourable. And it's almost perhaps, does that reflect um, what the uh, commanders were telling the soldiers? You will die. You will do this. You will take on those guns. Um, so I think it's quite interesting. It's an imperative verb, um, which almost brings back the idea of indoctrination and brainwashing um, that we've seen so many times in these um, poems, um, brings it to life there. So let's talk about the form and structure uh, of this poem. Now, the form of the poem is a narrative poem. It's a storytelling poem. Um, and he's recounting this honourable story that he wants us to remember, um, which I always hold with a pinch of salt, really. Is he is he trying to change history here? Although it was kind of bloodshed and whatever, is he trying to kind of, you know, is, is this a piece of propaganda, um, which is something you can talk about? But it, it, it could also suggest, couldn't it, because it's a narrative poem, that actually the idea, the very notion of dying gloriously is a, is a work of fiction. It's not true at all. And it's a myth. Uh, and does the form of, uh, of this poem perhaps make us question um, the the kind of the the actual subject matter of it. And secondly, the rhythm of the poem is in what's called dactylic meter. And um, you'll notice uh, the rhythm is, is kind of relentless and it's also hypnotic. It's known as a very hypno hypnotic uh, meter. And, you know, that that shows the relentlessness of it shows the bravery of the soldiers. They continue uh, to go into to, to battle. Some people say the rhythm kind of represents the horse's hooves, which is an interesting notion. But there's more intelligent interpretation, I'm sure. Um, uh, but perhaps if this meter is hypnotic, are we being hypnotized by Tennyson here? Is he trying to pull the wool over our eyes that war is glorious when actually it isn't? And were the soldiers themselves, were they hypnotized by this Victorian ideal, um, uh, which ultimately um, is proven to be a myth, I think, in this poem? But that's my interpretation. And finally, of course, we've got that final stanza um, is shorter than the others. And that represents uh, that represents death. So in terms of context, two very simple things um, is that Tennyson, he was poet laureate at the time of the charge uh, and the poem was written to commemorate the event and was published in, in newspapers. Um, I think I've always interpreted this poem as a piece of propaganda. Um, um, I think it was an absolute military disaster, the Battle of Balaclava. Uh, what this poem does was kind of dress over that and to say, actually, it wasn't a disaster. It was noble. It was honourable. Um, well, not really if you have your, your head shot off by a gun, quite frankly. But there we go. Um, and of course, Tennyson's view is uh, representative of the Victorian ideal that death in war was noble and glorious. And when we look at the poems of Ted Hughes and Wilfred Owen, we can see the opposite of that. So look, good luck with this poem. I'll test you on it next lesson. And um, I wonder which poem you might want to compare it with. How, where, etc, etc. Good luck and we'll see you soon.